What's up, folks? Huge shout out to Kaden Gardner, the author of this series. He just released a webtoon video that's set in the same universe as this one. Make sure you go check it out and subscribe to his channel to show your support. It's hard to properly describe the feeling of dying. The moment between the light going out and what's left of you passing on is seamless. I can remember the thoughts racing through my brain, the visions, all the memories I had, plans for the future wasted, all the people I'd killed. I wasn't what you'd call a good person before I was killed. That's kind of what had gotten me into the situation I was in at that moment. I was a member of the CIA Special Activities Division, a paramilitary operator in charge of a team of other operators that were assigned to break into a complex in Grozny. The complex was owned by a company called Gideon Pharmaceuticals. For those of you who don't know, Gideon is the most powerful entity on the planet. They've got fingers in everything. Miracle drugs, politicians, hotels, news networks, you name it, they probably own a stake in it. We'd been tipped off by a defector from their company that they had been working on a bioweapon, some new virus that could change the course of history. And it was being tested on civilians in Grozny. So naturally, the boss, Shaw, wanted it. Bing, bang, boom. We were there. The mission itself went without a hitch. We gathered intel for six months, then passed it to a local militia. Some of it legit, some of it not. It was enough to cause a full-scale riot at the complex. The militia somehow ended up with a briefcase with a vial of the weapon inside of it. We stole it from them relatively easy. Didn't take any casualties. Well, any fatal casualties. I ended up getting shot in the back of my shoulder while shoving Jamie's sorry ass away from gunfire. He'd smoked an acid-laced joint right before we'd infiltrate the militia outpost. Or so we'd been led to believe. We barely made it out into the safe house. This is where my story really starts. With me on my back. Bullet holes riddled my body as my blood pulled around me. Jamie's gun still smoking as he crouched over me. I was really hoping it wouldn't come to this. You left me no choice. The CIA can't make the world a better place. But I can't. Ja Jamie? I stammered as I coughed up blood. What? He asked with a smug grin on his face. Stop talking. I still had one last act of defiance in me as I raised my pistol and fired it one more time. <laughs> Jamie's ear exploded. If I had the strength, I'd have fired at him a few more times. But I didn't. He grabbed his bleeding ear whilst unloading his pistol into my body. That was when things started getting weird. They say that as you're dying, that you see your life pass before your eyes. They're not wrong. But they're not entirely right either. I only saw the bad stuff I did. The people I'd killed. Bodies I'd buried. Things I'd covered up to protect my team. It was like a gut punch from hell. I could see the day that Agent Chad Davis had been pursuing a terrorist to the streets of Amsterdam. Why we were there, I couldn't remember. But I do remember the gunfight. I remember Chad was cornered. He shot at what he thought was the terrorist. But instead, it was a little girl. Sometimes the worst part of being the best marksman in your class is not missing. It was an honest mistake. Chad was never the same again afterwards. He started using humor as a coping mechanism for stressful situations. That and expensive whiskey. I of course was seeing this because I covered our involvement in it up. I convinced Chad not to resign which made Jamie furious. It's probably part of the reason he killed me and stole the briefcase. After those visions stopped, I saw her. Agent Ophelia fucking wild. She was it for me. She was my endgame. I'd already bought the ring and had been planning my resignation when it happened. We'd been together for going on two years at that point. I can remember feeling happy that she wasn't on that particular mission with me, probably because Shaw was starting to figure out what was going on. 
Relationships between agents were forbidden on his team. We didn't care. Most of the team knew anyway. Chad found out on accident. Jamie, I'm not sure when. But I saw a vision of her. Hot tears streaming down her face as she stood next to my body. My death would destroy her. All because I let her get too close. But I couldn't help that I loved her. The next thing I knew, I was staring up at the sky. A man in a dark suit, blocking out the sun. He looked down at me with a stern expression. Hmm. Was all he said, before my vision faded. The next thing I knew, I was waking up. I was submerged in a thick, syrupy-like liquid that filled my lungs and burned my eyes. I was instantly in a panic as I began to try to thrash around. That was made difficult by the sheer consistency of the liquid. All of a sudden, I went from thrashing to falling. I landed hard on a cold tile floor, coughing and hacking up the liquid. <coughs> My eyes burned less as they were out in the open air. I wanted to scream but my lungs weren't empty yet. It took a good few minutes for me to get my bearings. I found myself in a white room, sitting naked in a puddle of red liquid. My eyes dotted around before finally landing on him. The man in the suit sat on a chair with a raised brow. Hello, Mr. Grayson, he said in a rather neutral voice. I squinted at him as I got to my feet. I tried to speak in response but I only barfed that red liquid. <laughs> Apologies, it's been a long time since I've done an initiation myself. I forget how messy they are. You should get your voice back momentarily. Being dead for two days does things to the vocal cords, rigor mortis and all, but it's nothing the serum can't fix. I remember the gunshots. My hand instinctively shot to my chest. The man smirked. Yes, Mr. Grayson, you were shot and killed 20 miles outside of Grozny. I could feel my heart start pounding. Hell, I could hear it too. I guess my face had a look of bewilderment to it, because the man only exhaled. I'm sure you have questions. Let's wait until the serum finishes its work before we talk. He said as he pulled a towel and some clothes from a nearby table and handed it to me. He smiled softly before turning and walking through a doorway. I wanted to follow, I really did, but my muscles hurt and my body just wanted to rest. I looked down at my chest where I'd been shot, only to find that it was all scar tissue. About two hours later, I was showered and clothed. I sat in what looked like a briefing room, my mind reminiscing the bullets tearing through my back and out my chest. I shuddered a bit as the projector screen ahead of me came to life. On it was a face I recognized all too well. The gruff skull of director Cameron Shaw. The video played. Hey Trent, sorry it had to be this way. You're probably wondering what the fuck is going on. So I'm gonna give you a quick explanation. You didn't make it back from our mission in Grozny. Officially, you are now KIA. If it makes you feel any better, Chad made it out. That being said, there is still work that needs to be done. Work that the CIA can't do on our end. Politics being what they are. Which is why the team can't know you're alive yet. I'm assigning you to a friend of mine. One who works outside the rules. Shaw took a breath. He's the one who brought you back. He'll see it that you're well equipped and ready to operate. I'll do what I can on my end. I'm sorry, Trent. There's a lot to do, and we've got a world to save. The screen cut off. I wish I could say that I was beyond confused, but I wasn't. I knew this was about Gideon and whatever they'd been up to. You see, technically, we weren't supposed to be looking into Gideon. Not officially. Every time an official investigation was opened up, our higher-ups came in and shut it down, which is why we manipulated the militia. We had to make it look like it was them we were after. I guess Gideon noticed, thanks in big part to Jamie. I sat still for a second as the man in the suit entered. It was then that I realized that it felt like we were moving. 
I deduced we were on some kind of custom aircraft. This your plane? I asked. He nodded. It is. You got a name? I asked. The man smirked. I've got several titles. From now, you can just call me Horseman. So, is now the time to start asking questions? I asked. I had several. Horseman nodded. Come with me, he said. I followed him out of the room and into a hallway. He was a step ahead of me the whole time. I brought you back using an ancient potion. I say ancient. It's been modernized. We used to call it the Omega Potion. I guess Omega Serum sounds better. A magic potion? I asked. More or less. This way. He led me into a room. This room had an entire armory. There were guns upon guns on the walls. But they weren't the thing that caught my eye. The metallic ninja suit in the center of the room was. This suit was sleek and futuristic. Its eyes had a blue glow to them. It consisted of black armor plates over an even blacker bodysuit. This is your armor. I slowly approached it, still trying to wrap my head around all that was happening around me. It's made from an alloy that can only be found one place in the entire multiverse. It's got plate armor over a bodysuit crafted from a nanotech made from the same metal. There isn't a weapon on earth that could scratch it. I outfitted it with everything you could think of. Night vision, thermal vision, a built-in EMP system, HUD displays. Hell, it can even turn invisible. My mind started buzzing as I stared at it. That was when I noticed that I could hear his heartbeat. It was steady, but I could hear it nonetheless. He looked at me, and as if he read my mind, he said, Yeah. The serum enhances some of your senses. Hearing, speed, strength. You'll catch on. The hearing is the worst part. Now put it on. We've got time for one training mission before we start operations. Training mission? I thought the training came before the missions. I asked. We don't have that kind of time. He replied. The suit was weirdly comfortable. It fits snugly, but not tight. It was easy to move around in. To say it was advanced was an understatement though. The HUD device even read my vitals at all times. I stood there, loading a scar L when Horseman walked out with a sword in his hand. You're going to need this, he said. I put the gun on my back and it clung to it like a magnet. I took the sword and examined it. It was also sleek in design. It was modeled after a gladius but the blade was maybe 10 inches longer. When I gripped the handle, the black blade began to glow a neon blue color. My hut flashed with a rising temperature warning. I put the sword on my back right next to the gun. The blade went back to black as I did so. I take it the sword is made out of the same stuff as the armor, I said. Correct, the horseman replied. So... What is this training mission? I asked. I'll be dropping you off on an island. Your task on said island will be to eliminate all hostile forces with extreme prejudice. Okay, who are the hostile forces? I asked. Horseman smiled, then snapped his fingers. The next thing I knew, I was standing on a beach underneath the light of a full moon. The waves danced softly as my hut went to work, examining the surrounding area. What the hell? I asked. What was that? That was a teleportation spell. Horseman's voice replied over my comm link. Did you just say spell? I asked. Mr. Grayson, you just came back from the dead. Is a magic spell really that far out of the question? I took a deep breath. Fine. Where are my targets? I turned to face away from the beach, revealing a thick tropical tree line. There's a small village about a click north of you. Head there. I made my way through the jungle. The whole area was deathly silent. 
My mind pondered on a few different things as I did so. Ophelia being the main thing. What a shot told her. Why couldn't my team know I was alive? I mean, I understood for operation's sake. Plausible deniability and whatnot. But I didn't agree. We were spies and soldiers. We kept secrets for a living. I heard it before I saw it. The groaning coming from the village. I readied my rifle. I wasn't sure what I was expecting to see as I made my way into the clearing just before the village. But two bloody men munching on the intestines of a woman, wasn't it? Horseman? What am I looking at? One of the men's heads snapped up. My hood zoomed in on his face. His eyes were both pale and milky. His mouth was soaked in blood and gore. My heart shuddered a bit. The man gave off an ungodly screech as he shot to his feet and started in full sprint in my direction. I raised my rifle and riddled him in the chest with a barrage of lead. But he didn't even slow down. The hit Trent. Shoot him in the head. I raised my rifle and fired. The man's face caved in and his body went limp. The next one came at me just as fast. I shot him as well. Everything went silent. Your heart rate is accelerated, said Horseman. No shit, I replied. Were those, were those fucking zombies? I asked as I looked at the dead woman with her entrails hanging out. Technically, yes. We refer to them as revenants. Revenants? Yes. I looked at the village. The place was a wreck. Blood soaked the small wooden buildings. Body parts were strewn about. The smell of decay and rotting meat permeated throughout the air. What happened here? I asked. Do you remember the weapon you stole? Lazarus? I asked. Yes. This village was used as a testing ground. I can remember growling under my breath. Gideon, I grumbled. Yes and no. The doorway to one of the buildings ahead of me rumbled. I raised my rifle again. Another revenant burst out and charged me. I fired my rifle once. Its body hit the dirt with a thud. What do you mean? The pathogen that revives the body is demonic in nature. I've been trying to figure out where they got it, which is part of the reason we're here. I kept walking through the center of the village, taking in the carnage around me. My hut lit up again, demonic energy signature located. My heart rate escalated even more. Are you saying Gideon made a deal with a demon? I asked. No, demons can't come to earth anymore, and if they did, they could only be summoned into an area that's been warded enough for them to stay on our plane of existence. A possessed person maybe, could be a witch. If you can find them and kill them, it should take care of the revenant problem on this island. I walked further into the village. I'd only seen three revenants. The village consisted of around eight or nine small wooden buildings, most of which were covered in blood. The smell of death got even worse as I reached the other side of the village. That was where I found the mass grave. My heart jumped into my throat. There was a pit filled to the brim with bodies. Most were torn to shreds. All looked as if they had been dead for a week. I stared at the pit for a second. This was undoubtedly Gideon's work, trying to cover up their tracks. I exhaled, my hut still reading the demonic energy signature. Except... It was coming from the pit. What now? I asked. Horseman didn't respond. He didn't have a chance, as a woman's voice giggled from the tree line beyond the pit. I raised my rifle. At the edge of the trees stood a woman in a knee-length white dress. Her face was rotting, almost like that of a corpse. I could see her decaying teeth through where her cheek used to be. My hut scanned her. Possessed female identified. A robotic voice said into my ear. I was just about to blow this thing's head off when an arm shot out of the pit and grabbed my ankle. I looked down to see a pair of glowing red eyes staring up at me. 
I pointed my rifle and fired. The revenant below me yanked my leg with an unexpected force. I lost my footing and fell backward, the red-eyed revenant leaping on top of me, now a missing chunk of its face from where I shot it, its blackened teeth gnashing and chomping at my armor. I managed to get my forearm up and into the creature's mouth. Its teeth shattered like glass on my armor as I used my other hand to grab a chunk of its black hair and yank back. The creature's scalp ripped off with a wet squelch. I almost gagged in my mouth when it happened as I thrust my forearm forward and twisted my body. The revenant and I ended up switching places. I was now on top of the walking corpse, my free hand shooting to my sword. I lopped the creature's head off with the burning blue blade. Its body went limp. That was when something slammed into my back. I barely held onto my sword as I was sent face first into the dirt. Several more revenants had jumped out of the pit and onto my back. I rolled as best as I could, wildly swinging my sword. I'm not sure how, but I made it to my feet, only to find myself surrounded by revenants on all sides. There had to have been at least two dozen, all of which had bullet holes in them from Gideon's mercenaries. They weren't covering up their tracks, they were giving it fresh corpses. Horseman said from the comm link. I gritted my teeth and readied myself for an onslaught. The revenants all jumped towards me at once, and the fight was on. I hacked and slashed, body parts were severed, heads rolled across the dirt. I wish I could say these things put up more of a fight. I wish I could say that I was winded when it was over. But I wasn't. My muscles didn't even hurt. Perks of being a super soldier, I guess. I stood there with the now doubly deceased Revenant's bodies all around me. My eyes locked on that possessed girl. There was a hint of fear in her pale eyes. She turned to run, but the moment she turned, a horseman was standing behind her. Hello girl, he said as his hand shot out and grabbed her by the throat. Which one of Abaddon's minions are you? He asked as he held her off the ground. The corpse laughed but not like a feminine laugh from earlier. This one was full on deep and demonic. You can't stop what's coming, horseman, it said. I walked up next to them, my eyes not leaving the woman for a second. I was in awe, but not really surprised at this point. It was just another thing that I was seeing today that wasn't supposed to exist. Let me guess, Victor summoned you, and in exchange for some revenant blood, you got a semi-comparable corpse in a small village to tear through. Am I wrong? Horseman asked. The corpse struggled against the horseman's grasp. You can't interfere. It's against the rules. It snarled. Wrong. I can interfere when a situation calls for it. A possessed corpse giving away the secrets of the revenant pathogen. That's one such situation, wouldn't you think? The thing's eyes locked on me then back on Horseman. Horseman dropped it to the ground. Trent, kill this thing. I slashed the corpse's head off with one swing. Horseman snapped his fingers, and we were back in the armory. I took the helmet off. I had a ton of questions, but before I could say anything, he cut me off. We need to figure out where Gideon is keeping its samples. I need to see what they're doing with this pathogen. They've probably cleared out the Grosny facility, I said. I know. Did the defector say anything about any other facilities? He asked. No. Horseman thought for a second. If you need to see the pathogen, why not extract it from one of the dead revenants? I asked. He held up a vial of blood. I did. But I don't think Victor Marks has any use for the base pathogen. I think... He wants to mutate it. I'm just unsure of how. He thought for a few seconds more before turning and looking at me. How would you like to go vampire hunting? I'm gonna assume I don't have a choice, I said. Horseman smirked. Also, it seems you're in need of a call sign. I raised my brow. It made sense, seeing as how I was to be operating off the books. Anonymity was important. What you have in mind? 
A few hours later, I found myself standing on a ledge overlooking a small beat-down warehouse. The sun was coming up any second. The skies had already begun changing color. How does one kill a vampire? I asked. Cut off its head or stab it through the heart with a silver blade. Although your sword should be able to do the trick just as handily. Horseman replied. Seems easy enough, I said as I inhaled. I heard the suit's camouflage system activated. To the naked eye, I was invisible. I watched as a beat-up red pickup pulled into the warehouse parking lot. It came to a stop right by the front door, and out stepped a tall and lanky man. My heart zoomed in on him, revealing a thin pale face and piercing blue eyes. The man looked worn out. Is that him? I asked. Jonathan Crawley. He specializes in obtaining things for the Eastern Vampire Coven. He's a human? I asked. I could hear Horseman chuckle. He was once, before he became a student of La Fay. But that's a story for another time. You've got a job to do. Infiltrating the warehouse was easy. It was even easier than I had anticipated since I was wearing the suit. As mentioned before, the warehouse wasn't large. It was maybe half the size of a grocery store. There were rows of dusty storage shelves that held wooden crates on them. I examined the label on one closely. It read, Gideon Pharmaceuticals. You seeing this? I asked. Not too surprising, Horseman said. What do you think is in here? I asked. The hut scanned the box. The box had a refrigerated case in it that held several bags of O-type blood. He's storing blood, I said. He sells to vampires. What did you expect? Horseman said with a hint of annoyed attitude. My mission was to get into the warehouse and snack one of Crowley's buyers. Horseman had gotten intel that there was a deal going down soon, so I was to wait inside the warehouse until they got there. It didn't take long for a blacked out SUV to show up. Crowley stood at one of the garage doors while two of his men carried one of the wooden crates his way. I watched from atop one of the shelves. The doors of the black SUV opened, and out stepped the man that made my hut system come to life. The man was tall and bald. He had a short beard and dark clothing. I think I found a vampire, I said. Dimitri Raslov. He's dangerous. Formerly a member of Moria's Black Guard. Moria? I asked. She is the head of the Eastern Vampire Coven. I watched Dimitri as he stopped ahead of Crowley. You lost weight, Dimitri greeted. I've been dieting. Here is your order, Crowley said abruptly. What's wrong, Mr. Crowley? Don't want to chat? I want to be paid. Dimitri rolled his eyes. I aimed my rifle at the back of Crowley's head. Dimitri reached into his jacket and pulled a stack of money out. The two of Crowley's men put the crate down at Dimitri's feet. The vampire knelt and ripped the top off with little effort. Underneath was revealed to be another pressurized container with a Gideon G stamped onto it. He hit a button and the container opened with a hiss. He reached inside. I thought he was going to pull some blood out. I really did. But instead, his head emerged from the container with a skull. What the fuck? I asked. My head zoomed in on the skull. It was covered in symbols that were identified as runes. Runes that started to glow a neon blue color when he touched it. It's just a rune skull, Horseman said. What does it do? I asked. Rune skulls are taken from dead magic practitioners. They can be very powerful sources of magical energy. Be careful. I adjusted the aim of my rifle. Are they bulletproof? I asked. Nemesis? I don't think. The horseman was interrupted by a sudden scream as a naked man was pulled kicking and screaming from the back of Dimitri's SUV by two more vampires. I watched as Crowley threw his hands up in an annoyed manner. The two of Crowley's henchmen recoiled in disgust before Crowley dismissed them with a hand wave. What is this, Dimitri? 
he asked. This is a thief. We caught him stealing. I know what a thief is, you fucking bloodsucker. What is he doing here? I don't keep bodies in my properties. Dimitri held up the skull. I meant fresh bodies, you imbecile. Relax, I'm just testing the skull. Dimitri said as he placed his free hand on the screaming man's forehead. The man screamed one last vocal cord shattering scream before his eye sockets began to glow as his insides boiled. Dimitri laughing maniacally as the ruined skull did its grisly work. The man crumpled to the ground. I sat there in shock. You need to move, Horseman's voice said. I readjusted my aim and fired. The rune skull flew from Dimitri's hand. His eyes shot up to my general vicinity, but I was still cloaked. Crowley turned and started looking around. Where did that? He didn't get to finish his sentence as I fired another round into his chest. The man collapsed onto the ground. And that was when I noticed Dimitri's eyes lock onto me. Shit, I said. There, Dimitri shouted as his two vampiric henchmen started making their way toward my direction. I flicked the selector switch on my rifle to full auto. The vampires were fast. They moved in almost a blur. Or they would have if they had been going after a normal man. I unloaded my rifle at them as they zoomed up the side of the shelf. I went to pull my sword, but one was already in my face. I was being kicked to the ground. I hit the floor after a 20 foot drop with a hard thud, dropping my sword. I got to my feet to find the other henchman in my face. A dagger was coming down onto my shoulder, but my armor held and the blade shattered on impact. Now it was my turn. I threw a left cross at the vampire's cheek. The punch landed, maybe a bit harder than the creature was expecting as my armored knuckles tore flesh and bone from his face. The vampire fell to the floor as I turned and dove for my sword, my hand grabbing it just as the other vampire tackled me to the ground. There was a short scuffle. He tried and failed to claw through my armor. I managed to swing my sword one good time, and he stopped moving. His head bounced across the floor. I shot to my feet as the other henchman stumbled to his. He hissed at me, showing his sharpened teeth. I shoved my burning blue blade through his face in response before my eyes met Dimitri who held the skull in one hand again, a bullet hole now marking above the eye. Who are you? He asked with a smile. I didn't answer. I took two powerful strides towards him. My goal was to capture him to be interrogated. But he was no slouch. He lifted the skull in my direction and cackled, right before the thing's eyes began to glow blue. A warning signal shot through my hut. Energy blast imminent. I quickly leapt to one side as two white hot burning beams of energy came flying at me. I dodged them by a few inches, landing behind a shelf in the warehouse. But the beams didn't stop coming for me. They cut through the shelf's support columns, causing it to collapse loudly. The next thing I knew, the warehouse was up in flames. I got to my feet as the place began to burn around me. The grip on my sword tightened. I heard feet shuffling behind me. I turned to see Dimitri with the skull aimed to my direction. Fuck, I said as the eyes ignited blue. I didn't get the chance to touch the beam. It hit me square in the chest. But to my surprise, the armor held perfectly, the beam reflecting off and slicing through a nearby wall. I watched Dimitri's smile transform to a look of pure and utter terror. He turned to run, but before he could, I had already thrown my sword at him, the point landing in the back of his thigh. He screamed in pain as he collapsed to the floor. I walked over to him as he tried to crawl away. I have him, I said as I yanked my sword out with a squelch. That was when I heard more movement. My eyes shot forward where Crowley staggered to his feet. He sneered at me. I readied myself for a fight, raising my glowing blue sword. Crowley's eyes shot to my sword, then they grew large. You're an Omega? I didn't answer. Dimitri crawled from underneath me as I stepped on his wounded leg. 
Crowley's eyes seemed fearful. He instinctively stepped back, then snapped his fingers and disappeared. That pussy, Dimitri growled. I replied to that with a boot to his face, then I heard a snap. The next thing I knew, we were in the armory again. A horseman was standing there with one hand in a pocket and the wound skull in the other. Dimitri took one look at him and recoiled in fear. You? He yelped. A horseman squatted down to get face to face with him. Hello, Dimitri. What's it been? A hundred years? Not long enough. What do you want? I need information and some of your blood. Dimitri looked confused. What information could I give you? Well, for one, I didn't realize that the Eastern Vampire Coven was getting their cloned blood from Gideon. We buy it from Crowley. No, Crowley is a middleman who arranges the deals. I've known him longer than you have. I don't... Horseman tapped Dimitri on the forehead, and he passed out. My eyes went large as Horseman stood up to face me. Why do we need his blood? I asked. Well, for one, vampires and revenants are both derived from the same pathogen, albeit with different mutations. It's a working theory, but I wonder if Victor means to try and blend the two somehow. Why would you think that? I asked. Horseman thought for a second. We're going to interrogate our friend here. Hopefully we can see where exactly Crowley was picking up his stuff. I'd bet that Gideon has some files we can take. Why not just capture Crowley? I asked. Trust me, this is easier. Horseman said with a smirk. We interrogated Dimitri when he woke up. Well, it wasn't much of an interrogation. Horseman did some kind of mind-reading spell on him that revealed the Gideon facility that Crowley received his product from was a storage facility in the Alaskan wilderness. One that Horseman was undoubtedly going to send me to. He gave me a good couple hours to prep for the mission. That and to rest. I studied the report he'd given me closely. It was all information he'd plucked from Dimitri's head before he teleported him off. As I studied, my thoughts drifted to Ophelia. I could remember the last time we'd been together. We'd been on a mission in Juarez to do surveillance on a cartel boss called Carlos Estevez. The mission went sideways and he tried to assault her. She killed him for it and we had to escape. We made it back to the safe house, and one thing led to another. At least, until Chad walked his happy ass in. I missed her. I missed her a lot. She was always so strong and straightforward. She always knew what she wanted. I imagined at that moment that what she wanted was revenge on Jamie. The Alaskan facility was codenamed Site 73. We didn't get much from Dimitri, other than the name and that it was a storage facility, so we weren't entirely sure what to expect. Horseman and I discussed doing surveillance, but he pointed out that Crowley probably used teleportation spells to get in and out, so the facility was probably warded, which meant that unauthorized teleportation inside would be nigh impossible. But we needed to go inside regardless. We needed to access any files on Lazarus we could find. We should have gone after Crowley, I said as I leaned back in my chair. Horseman scoffed. Even if we caught him, getting information could prove difficult. Why? I asked. Most magicians have fail-safe spells for when they get caught. They're tricky to decipher. Are you saying you couldn't? I asked. I could, but Crowley is a... I've dealt with him before. It's complicated. I took a deep breath. Well, shit. What about one of his lackeys? I asked. A horseman raised a brow at me. That could work. Are there any left alive? They weren't involved in the fight. A horseman vanished with a snap, then reappeared a few seconds later. They died in the fire, he said sternly. I groaned. Horseman held up a hand containing a file. I did find this though, he said as he tossed it in front of me. What is it? I asked. A file. 
No shit, I asked as I opened it. Inside was a note from Crowley that read, Here's my file on site 73. Now, stay out of my business. I eyed Horseman. That was convenient. He shrugged. He knows who he's dealing with. I told you, it's complicated. I sighed as I looked over the file. It confirmed what Horseman was worried about. The facility was worded on the inside. It was also mostly on the ground. I would need to get in through the front door. That was the easy part. The hard part would be getting to the front door. If there was a reason Gideon had chosen that area, more supernatural shit that I didn't understand yet. This one about the guards of the facility. A skinwalker and three to four windigos. Ah, shit. I mumbled to myself as I fished the picture of the windigo from the file. The creature looked absolutely horrifying. It was tall and had an emaciated humanoid body with thin pale white skin. It had an almost dog-like snout and a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth as well, as well as two antlers atop its head. Okay, how do I kill it? I asked. The horseman chuckled. Your sword, Mr. Grayson. It can kill anything short of an angel or archdemon, but you have to hit the heart, he said before taking a breath. However, you need to be wary of the skinwalker. They like to play mind games, make you see memories, loved ones. I've warded off your suit best I can. But, I asked, it will protect you from any psychic attacks, but skinwalkers are shapeshifters by nature. Remember that, Trent. Just because you're protected from psychic attacks doesn't mean that it can't play mind games with you. A little while later, I found myself stalking through the cold Alaskan wilderness, the snow crunching beneath my boots with every step. I was maybe a mile from the facility, my hut scanning the woods ahead of me. The thermometer read 12 degrees, but my suit kept me warm. The forest was silent and covered in a white layer of snow. I trudged along, ever vigilant. That was when my hut picked up something. A body in the distance. I approached it cautiously. The dead bear's fur was matted in blood, and its entrails had been completely removed. Crimson decorated the trees and ground around me. You seeing this? I asked as I scanned the ground. Whatever had done this hadn't left any tracks whatsoever. I could feel my heart rate escalate. Windigo? I asked. Likely, said Horseman. I continued moving around, now aware that these things could kill full-grown grizzly bears with ease. I didn't make it far, however, when I heard a branch move from behind me. I slowly grabbed my sword from my back and ignited the neon blue blade. I turned quickly, just as the creature leapt from a nearby tree, its pale skin already covered in crimson liquid. I slashed my sword at it, gashing its side before shoving the point into its throat. The piece went limp as I yanked the blade out. It collapsed to the snow. I looked down at my good work when I heard the horseman's voice call out to me. Destroy the heart, Trent. I didn't have the time to register this as the windigo suddenly flew to its feet with an upward swipe of its clawed hand, letting out a shrill roar that echoed across the snow-colored forest. I was sent sailing into a nearby tree which snapped in half from the sheer force of my impact. I struggled to sit up in the snow, but the beast was already on top of me, clawing and biting at my armor. I stepped at once in the ribs, then twice, then a flurry of times. Blood spewed out from the wound like water from a fountain before it howled in pain and went limp. I pushed the body off of me and got to my feet. I was almost out of breath and irritated with myself. That was when I heard more movement. I turned quickly, where three more windigo had begun emerging from the trees. I steadied myself for a fight, now more angry than anything. They charged in with a growl. I charged back. I was ready this time, killing the first with a quick step to the heart before flinging its body into the second. The second fell to the ground while I shoved my sword into the third's chest. It fell down dead. I then turned my attention to the second one as it shoved its brother's body off of itself. 
it let off a shrill cry as it charged in. I again braced myself. It swiped its claw at me. I dodged it and shoved the point of my sword into its chest. The beast went limp as it fell to the ground. I stood over the bodies of the Wendigos for a few moments, looking down at my precise work. Now, where's the skinwalker? I asked myself. Keep walking towards the facility. I'm sure you'll find it. Very funny, I replied. I made it to the charcoal gray steel door of Site 73 within a few minutes. It looked like the entrance to a bunker. I studied it closely. The facility was indeed underground, the only entrance being the door I was staring at. It wasn't large by any means, not like a super bunker you'd find government officials hiding under, but it was big enough to fit a small car through. The doorway was also in a clearing, and based on the structure, I assumed it led to a ramp. I looked around. There were no roads or humanoid footprints. I looked back at the door. How do I open this thing? I asked. That was when my suit heard something. Something chattering in the distance. Something I recognized myself as a former soldier. Did we call in air support? I asked as I hit the cloaking device on my suit and leapt atop the bunker door frame. A black commercial chopper flew over the tree line before coming to a stop right above the clearing. Ropes fell out the sides and men in black uniforms fast roped down. I put my sword on my back and pulled my rifle. The four soldiers landed in formation, aiming their weapons around in a tactical manner. I leveled my weapon with the lead one's head. I'm not seeing any signs of a breach, the leader said as he approached the doorway. Gideon security forces, careful how you engage, they probably have more nearby. Horseman said overcomes. The lead soldier looked down at his feet and knelt. I've got tracks, he said. Shit, I grumbled. Another of the soldiers stopped next to the leader. So, they take out four Wendigo and then just disappears before entering the facility? He asked. The leader looked straight at where I was crouching. I don't think- I didn't hesitate before firing. I shot the man in the face, the next guy in the throat, and the next two in their heads. The chopper started to fly away, the fast ropes still hanging down into the snow. At guessed they forgot to release them, or the releasing mechanism jammed. Either way, I didn't care. Don't let the chopper escape, Horseman said. How? I started as I ran towards the chopper, placing the rifle on my back as I did so. I managed to grab onto one of the fast ropes with one hand at the last second before it ventured over the tree line, clinging on for dear life as it began to drag me back into the forest. Branches broke over my armor as my hut went ballistic. My free hand flailed around until it found a very thick branch and clung onto it. To my surprise, the chopper came to a sudden and abrupt stop in the air as I held it in place by its fast rope. I was straining hard as I pulled the rope. The chopper's engine roared as it tried to escape. Until finally, the ropes released and I was dropped to the forest floor. The chopper pilot, however, lost control of his craft and it was sent careening into the forest, slamming into the ground in a bright orange explosion. I got to my feet again, now knowing that I really needed to hurry. I practically ran back to the doorway. When I got there, however, I came to a screeching halt. My heart had jumped into my throat when I saw it. I went weak in the knees as my eyes met hers. She looked so frail and cold. Her once brown hair was matted in blood, and her face looked frostbitten. It was Ophelia. My Ophelia. Trent? Is that you? She asked. Trent, it's so cold out here. She cried. I stood there in shock for a moment or two, just staring her down. Trent, I miss you. She cried. I'm not sure the skinwalker had any clue that my hut had already figured out that the thing I was staring at wasn't human. But it figured out when my sword ignited. Ophelia straightened up, smiling wickedly as she did so. All right then, 
How about this one? The creature's skin rippled and morphed. The change was almost instantaneous. Suddenly, I wasn't staring at Ophelia anymore, but into the green eyes of the man who took my life. The one who'd separated Ophelia and I. Jamie King stood before me, a joint hanging from his mouth as he stroked his ginger goatee. What's wrong, Trent? You look like you've seen a ghost. I didn't have time for games. I took two power steps towards him and tried to take his head. The skinwalker vanished, reappearing on the top of the door structure. Did I strike a nerve? Jamie asked. You're not Jamie, I growled. No, it said as it morphed again. This time, I was now staring into the mustached face of my best friend Chad. How about a friendly face? It asked, before vanishing again. I tightened the grip onto my sword. Don't let it play games with you, Horseman said overcomes. My grip tightened even harder. Ah, Agent Trent Grayson, best to ever do it. The skinwalker mocked in my best friend's voice as it reappeared behind me. I turned to it. But an invisible force sent me sailing into the steel door. Oh, how the spirits talk about you, it said, morphing yet again. The chosen herald of death himself pulled back to the land of the living. I could feel as the force pushed me against the wall even harder. I found myself looking into the eyes of a young girl. The same young girl that Chad had accidentally shot. But are you worthy of a second chance? With all the pain you've caused? I growled as I strained against the force. You're nothing but a killer. I strained even harder, managing to get a thumb around one of the pins of the flashbangs on my waist. I pulled it. There was a bright light that would have been blinding to anyone who wasn't wearing a suit built by the horseman. The little girl shielded her eyes. I shot forward, my hand finding her neck and my sword making its way into her guts. Her eyes went wide. I am a killer. I growled as I jammed the blade in deeper. She morphed again, this time turning into an old, native-looking woman that I'd never seen before. I dropped her to the ground before turning back to the doorway. There wasn't any kind of scanner, no keyhole. I took a second to think. I wasn't sure how to go about doing this. Then, the thought occurred to me. I wondered if the sword could cut through the steel. I raised the weapon and stabbed the doorway. To my surprise, it went through like a knife through butter. It took a few minutes of cutting before I made it through. The facility was surprisingly empty of people. It was also surprisingly simple, being a warehouse with more of these pressurized containers, none of which contained any test batches of Lazarus. Luckily, there was also a computer inside, a massive computer that took up the entire wall. I approached it, and my suit began to hack into the files inside. Intuitive, I grunted. Files flashed before my eyes. Search keyword Lazarus, I commanded the suit. We found the file quickly. The only issue, the file itself was locked. I couldn't bypass it either. We can't access the file from this server. We need to go to the main one. Where's that? There's two facilities, one in New York, one in Tokyo. Gideon HQ would never be able to break into the New York facility. It's the most heavily guarded building in the world. I said as I got up and headed for the exit. So, Tokyo, Horseman said. Not as heavily guarded, still dangerous, but we need those files. Well then, let's get started. I stood at the exit, looking out at the bodies that still lay in the snow ahead of me the tree line smoking from the helicopter crash. My mind pondered with the encounter with the skinwalker. I killed all these people. Whether I was a monster or not was debatable. I had purpose now, even after my own death. Now servant of the literal horseman of death himself. I am what the world needed me to be. I am a weapon. I am Nemesis.
I never liked killing people. I know that sounds weird, given my profession. But I always saw it as just part of the job. By the time I'd been killed myself, I'd racked up quite the kill count. Officially, according to the CIA records, it had been at 73. But deep down, I knew that number was wrong. It's funny, I'd never really thought about it before I died. Them, I mean, the ones whose lives I'd ended. The only death that I'd been responsible for, that I'd even felt remotely guilty about, was that poor girl in Amsterdam. But I didn't even pull the trigger. Killing people, to me, was always just an unfortunate consequence to complete the job. I can remember shortly before Jamie shot me in the back, I'd had a conversation with Chad. I was fresh off of my argument with Jamie. As mentioned, he had gotten me shot during our operation, then tried to gaslight me into thinking that being high on an operation was the same level of violation as dating a teammate. He then brought up the Amsterdam incident. The argument was short and heated. Tempers flared. He was inside the vehicle as I was pulling the briefcase containing Lazarus out to check it. Since when have you become a beacon of morality? You know we're not the good guys. You don't really care that Chad shot that kid. You just want to tear everyone else down because you're too damn insecure to admit you made a mistake. You better sober up on missions or you won't be going on them with me. I growled before I slammed the van door shut. I walked the briefcase over to the hood of the van and opened it. Chad followed me. What's with the we're not the good guys comment? I can remember being perplexed. He knew the answer to that question. At least, I thought he did. Why does it matter? I asked. Because I don't want to be the bad guy, he said. There was something that stuck with me, even in death. Truthfully, I never thought we were evil, just men and women doing a job. Sometimes the job was bad. I'd never once thought to focus on it though. My focus was always on my team. Getting them out in one piece was everything. I stood next to the horseman in the middle of a desert. The sun was in the process of rising, bathing the sky in an orange haze. There was a slight breeze in the air, one that I could almost feel through my armor. Who are we meeting here? I asked as three figures crested in the sand dune ahead of us. All three were churned in white cloaks and hoods covering their faces. Allies. The three figures came to a stop a few paces ahead of us. They removed their hoods, revealing two males and a female. The lead male, Raziel, was a tall and broad black man. To the right of him, the dark-haired and olive-skinned Rain. To the left stood an Arabic-looking man called Aguilar. The horsemen greeted them by their names. My suit's hut started reading off insane amounts of energy coming from their very bodies. Energy that my suit read off as angelic essence. I admit, I was fixated on the trio. I was standing before literal angels. Yet, they looked like normal people. The conversation between them and the horseman was short. I honestly missed most of it. Before I knew it, they were walking away and the horseman was snapping his fingers. Angelic allies, I pondered, thinking out loud as the horseman walked to his computer. We have angelic enemies as well. Now, get some rest. You're gonna need it. I slept and dreamt mostly of Ophelia. I dreamt about our last night together. I hadn't seen her in months before I was killed. Now, I didn't know if I'd ever see her again. I was awoken by horsemen walking into my quarters. I could feel the plane bouncing with turbulence underneath me. What do you want? I asked. It's time. I exhaled as I got to my feet. There was work that needed to be done. A few moments later, I was in my armor. Horsemen sat on a computer close by. I've been meaning to ask, ever since the fight with that skinwalker. Yes. I am a literal horseman from the Bible, horseman said without looking up. How did you know that was what I was going to ask? I can see everything you see while you're in the suit, Mr. Grayson, 
I assumed you'd ask sooner. I'm working for the Grim Reaper? That's fucking awesome. I said sarcastically. Wait, how'd you meet Shaw? I asked. Shaw used to be in a unit that hunted down supernatural threats. No shit. Horseman looked at me and shrugged. The building isn't worded to teleportation spells. How do you know? I asked. Horseman typed on his computer some more. The screen ahead of me lit up. Horseman was standing at a desk across from a sitting figure. A figure that looked familiar. Even more so when he shot to his feet and punched his desk in two. Angelic enemies. He wore a white suit with a dark red tie. His blue eyes filled with rage as he shouted something at Horseman. You were there recently having an argument? Trying to convince Victor to stop before the world ends. And here I thought the four horsemen were supposed to help end the world. Horseman laughed. If only it were so simple. The horsemen exist to prevent humanity from going extinct. The reason people assume they were harbingers of the end is because we used to take 100 years shifts where only one of us would defend Earth Prime. All four of us being together would usually be a sign of a catastrophic event. He went back to typing. The room went silent. I'd come back to thinking. My mind's now curious about something else. Where's Ophelia and her team? Chasing a lead in Mexico. They're alive? They couldn't chase leads if they weren't. Are you ready? I'm going to teleport you inside the building. What if Victor's there? The screen in front of me switched again, now showing a news report by a group called The Random Onion. Victor was being hounded by reporters as he was being let into Gideon Tower in New York City. The headline read, Morales Bioware Unveils Easy Pill Variant. He's got a lot on his plate right now. He's gonna have Hector Morales killed, isn't he? I asked. He already tried. Hector's got good security. A light bender, to be precise. Which leads me to my next point of emphasis. You may run into a light bender or two while on this operation. What's a light bender? I asked. A human with angelic heritage. Their order was created to hunt rogue gods. They're dangerous, but they aren't our enemies. So should you have an encounter, don't kill them. They may be allies in the coming struggle. I did a mock salute. Horseman rolled his eyes and snapped his fingers. I found myself in a hallway, very quickly cloaking my suit just as a couple of armed guards came walking around the corner. Where's the mainframe? I asked as I leaned back against the wall so the guards wouldn't run into me. Victor's office. I put you on the same floor. You just need to get there. Horseman replied. I followed the hallway until I reached the doorway that led straight into the office. I hadn't seen any more guards along the way. It was a massive heavy wooden door. I exhaled as I reached for the handle. I tried to turn the knob, but it was locked. Well, that's… that's unfortunate, I said. Can you teleport me inside? I asked. I just tried. It didn't work. He warded his office? I asked. Probably. I rolled my eyes and kicked the door open. The moment I did so, however, an alarm went off. Oh, come on. I groaned as I turned around. Seriously, Nemesis, what did you expect? Horseman griped into my comms. The hallway itself had marble floors and walls. It was well illuminated by the lights on the ceiling. I readied my rifle as the carts rounded the corner towards the room. I was still cloaked, so they couldn't see me. Not that it would help them if they did. The men were your typical Gideon security forces. They wore black tactical uniforms and wielded submachine guns. I stood still in the hallway against one of the walls, hoping that they wouldn't bump into me. There were eight or nine of them now. They were all very confused. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't find their confusion amusing. The lead mercenary looked at the door, which I'd kicked off its hinges and then back at one of the bigger guys in the group. Did you do this, Lopez? He asked. I could see Lopez's eyes squint inside of his goggles. I was with you when the alarm went off. You were? The leader asked. 
What could have done this? That door is easily 400 pounds, another soldier said. My eyes shot to another soldier, one who had wandered a bit closer to me. He was within arm's reach. The leader shut the alarm off and got on his radio. Hey, Captain Grunk, there isn't anyone up here, he said. Yes, I know the door was kicked in, but there's no one up there. Yes, we did check Victor's office. What do you mean check under the desk? It's still broken. The soldier in front of me took a step backward, getting even closer. I took a step to the side. He backed into the wall, leaning right next to me. Maybe a ghost did it, he said to the leader. Shut up, Felix, the leader said. I'm just saying, shit's weird. I found myself holding my breath. I didn't want to kill these guys, but I would if I had to. That was when my hut picked up on something. Something around the room. A goddamn fly. One that was coming straight for me. Oh, for fuck's sake, I muttered as it landed on me. I watched as Felix's eyes stared at it for a second, as if trying to figure out what was wrong with what he was seeing. Is that a fly? Walking on air? Flies can fly tip shit, the leader said. No. Yes, they can. That's why they have wings. No, asshole. I mean, this fly is literally walking on. His eyes got really big. It's a fucking ghost. The whole group was now staring at the fly on my head. I knew they couldn't see me, but the fly had given away that I was there. I also knew that if I fired my rifle, they'd open fire and alert the rest of the building. So, while they all stared at the fly sitting on my head, I drew my sword. I had all nine of them huddled around me, all close by. I watched them eagerly, seeing who would move first. It was the leader who reached his hand out and tried to swat the fly on my head. I knew I had to move fast. I swiped my sword up and lopped his arm off, then his head. Then I moved onto the next person, then the next. I moved in a blur, too fast for them to react. Within seconds, the marble hallway was covered in crimson puddles and body parts. I stood amongst the bodies for a second, my eyes looking up at the camera above me. Don't worry about that. I managed to get into their security system. Hurry up, nemesis. Horseman's voice called overcomes. I exhaled. I just killed nine people over a fucking fly. I said as I walked into Victor's office. The room was big as it took up nearly half of this entire floor. There was a large computer on one of the walls, a computer that was similar to the one I'd seen at the facility in Alaska. I stood near it as my suit took over, hacking through files and displaying them on my hut. Show me files for Operation Lazarus, I said. The files that had been locked on the other server appeared in front of me. One of the files that crossed my face had a name, Grace Stone. The files loaded into my suit's CPU. More voices came from the hallway. You've got light benders in the hallway, Horseman's voice said. I looked up just as the two walked in the doorway. They didn't look how I'd expected. One was an Arabic male and the other was an Asian female. Both wore ropes under a white and silver breastplate. The male had a weapon aimed at me. It looked almost like a crossbow. But my hut identified it as a light energy blaster. The woman had a spear in her hand and two chakrams on her hips. They both stopped dead in their tracks when they saw me. I guess we double booked, I said casually, stepping away from the computer. Who are you? The woman asked sharply. My friends call me Nemesis. You want to be my friend? I asked. Did you seriously just ask her if she wanted to be friends? Horseman asked over my comm link. I want to know what you're doing here. The woman replied. I shrugged. Same as you. Stealing shit. Now, if you'll excuse me. I need to. You're coming with us. The Grand Master might have some questions. I could see her grip tighten on her spear, and I could tell by the look in her eyes that she wasn't going to back down. I groaned as I pulled my sword from my back. You sure about this lady? You're not gonna like how this goes. The woman growled as she suddenly thrust her spear at me. 
I caught it with my free hand right below the spear point, maybe an inch from my chest. The spear was glowing yellow and burning hot. My hut alarm blaring a warning about angelic essence. That was impressive, I said right before knocking her spear to the ground with my sword. The woman froze with a look of shock upon her face. The moment I did this, the man fired his blaster, the white beam of energy deflecting off of my chest plate before scorching the floor and taking out a nearby window. Seriously? I asked. The woman regained her bearings and took a swing at me. I dropped kicked her, sending her sailing back into the man. The woman got to her feet quickly, pulling the chakrams from her hips, both of them glowing yellow and burning just as hot as her spear. I exhaled as I looked at him. So, we're ripping off Tron now? I'm more of a Star Wars guy myself. I ignited my burning blue sword as the woman charged me. She was pissed, swinging wildly. I dodged most blows, blocked others, using her rage and impatience along with my own muscle memory to my advantage. It took a second or two, but I found an opening, reaching out and snatching her wrist with my free hand, bending it back just right to cause her to drop her chakram. She fell to her knees, gritted her teeth in pain as she did so. Are we done yet? I asked with a little more boom in my voice. She replied to this by slashing my leg with her other chakram. The weapon only bounced off my armor. Oh, come on, I complained. Let her go, the man said from in front of me, his blaster raised and his face full of annoyance. Yeah, I'm going to, once she calms down. The man lowered his weapon upon hearing this. The woman hit me one or two times before dropping her weapon. At this point, I was more annoyed than anything. As fun as that was, I've got a tight schedule to keep. I left the system open in case you need it. Do yourself a favor, look at the files pertaining to Operation Lazarus. They might get your Grandmaster's attention. I said as I started to walk away. I was headed for the window, of course. I got to the edge when the annoyed woman called out to me. Who are you? She asked. I wondered the same thing, but I didn't really have an answer myself. Then it hit me. A weapon, I said as I stepped out of the window. I was very quickly teleported into the armory. A horseman was sitting at the computer looking at a picture of a man that I didn't recognize. Who's that? I asked. This is David Stone. He was in Shaw's old CIA unit, a horseman said. I took my helmet off, then walked over to him. Why is he in the Lazarus file then? Why does Gideon want him? I asked. They don't. They want his daughter. His daughter? David was the lead interrogator for the Supernatural Operations Department. He specialized in breaking vampires during a Cold War-style conflict that the CIA dubbed the Shadow War. A horseman exhaled as he thought for a moment. He left the department after he started a relationship with one of the Eastern Vampire Coven's royal family members. That relationship resulted in a daughter called Grace Stone. I cut him off. A horseman nodded. He's got a vampire wife? I asked. Hat. The leader of the coven, Madam Tippis, had her killed. She wanted the kid killed too, but it didn't work out. Since then, David's raised the child alone, getting occasional help from the Swiss guard. Why does Gideon want the girl? I asked. I have a theory, but I'm not 100% sure. What's the theory? I asked. To create both revenants and vampires, your host needs to first be dead. Grace has all the powers of a vampire without being completely dead. Her blood may be the key to creating a version of the Revenant pathogen that can infect a living host. So we need to find her, I asked. Horseman nodded. They have a satellite tracking her, but her dad's been doing a good job keeping her safe. They're at a safe house in Paris now, but the satellite Gideon is using to track her is very advanced. They've already got men set up. I need you on the ground. Get them out. Get them too. Horseman typed a bit more. Safe house, 62B. On the ground. I like it, I said, remembering which safe house that was. Horseman nodded. I'll get in touch with Shaw. 62B won't be a permanent solution. 
He won't like it. He hates Shaw. But it's not like he has a choice. I nodded as I put my helmet back on. Horseman stood up and handed me an old cell phone. Give this to David. It's got Shaw's number in it. You said he hates Shaw. If he wants his daughter to survive, he'll use it. With that, he snapped his fingers. I found myself standing on the roof of a building. The Paris outskirts were covered in snow. My hut already loaded with the location of the building that the stones were hiding at. I'd been teleported to a rooftop maybe a block away. I could see as a black SUV was driving up the building's front entrance. I knew I needed to hurry. I jumped from roof to roof, watching as the mercenaries in black uniforms exited their vehicles and started moving to the front door. I had cloaked myself as I made it to the roof of the target building. As soon as I stopped, Grace burst through the exit door on the roof, followed by a priest. I watched as Grace ran towards the edge facing the street, coming to a stop at the edge of the roof. Shit, she said. Language, the priest replied. Seriously? The girl replied with an annoyed voice. I watched them. The girl had a slender frame and raven black hair. Her skin was also extremely pale. I watched her closely. She was so young, yet she was calm despite everything. Gunfire suddenly erupted from inside the building below us. Dad? She asked sharply. Your dad will be fine, the priest replied. That was when the door opened and David Stone came running out. Back already? The priest asked. They had some really big guns, said David. Four mercenaries in black tactical uniforms burst through the doorway behind them with their weapons raised. David, Grace, and the priest had found themselves on the edge of the roof. I watched the lead mercenary as I readied my sword. Drop your weapons and give us the girl, he said in an English accent. There was a standoff now. Things were silent and no one knew I was there. What do we do? It's not like we can jump, the priest asked. We can't, but she can, David replied. Grace's face contorted in confusion. What? I'm not leaving. But she was interrupted by the priest suddenly shoving her off the roof. Shit, I shouted as I suddenly leapt into action. I cut down three or four of the mercenaries in seconds, and I was about to slice the legs off of the lead one when Horseman's voice stopped me. Not him. He could have more information. I stayed my sword, instead delivering a right-hand cross that put him on his ass. I decloaked in front of David and the priest. He's all yours, I said as I stepped past him, only stopping at the edge of the roof. Grace was on her back, staring up at me. Two mercenaries loomed over her. I leapt down, landing in between them and slicing the nearest one's head from his shoulders before stabbing the second one to his stomach. The bodies fell as I looked down at Grace. The girl looked horrified. I couldn't blame her though. I reached a hand for her. Let's go, kid. Your dad is upstairs. He's fine. Maybe a little traumatized, but fine. I helped her up and she ran past me back into the building. I followed her inside the safe house and up to the roof. As we got to the last floor, I came to a stop as I saw the naked vampire tied to a chair with silver wire. His body was missing half its head and covered in cuts. That was brutal. Even for me, that was brutal. I made it up to the roof a few seconds after Grace, where I found the priest holding the lead mercenary down. David's eyes found me very quickly, and as any good interrogator would, he started asking questions. Who are you? A friend of a friend, I replied as I pulled the cell phone out and handed it to him. What's this? He asked. It's got the coordinates of an underground safe house that's just outside the city. We're going to send you there to wait for our next move. The phone also has an old associate of yours' phone number. You need to call him. I could see David's face contorting annoyance. You're one of Shaw's. I laughed. Hell no, but he can help. The group, along with the prisoner they'd captured, were suddenly teleported away from me. I found myself standing face to face with Horseman, who'd teleported himself onto the roof. 
he had a serious look about him. One that screamed, something bad was about to happen. I sent him to the safe house. David should be able to get information from the mercenary. I'm honestly scared for the mercenary, I admit it. I could see him exhale. He had something he wanted to tell me, but he was searching for the right words. What? I asked. Ophelia's team. They've been captured. A few moments later, we were back in the armory. Ophelia had taken the team to Mexico to track Jamie. Jamie had set up a perfect trap. Now Ophelia and her team had been taken. What do we do? I asked. We know they were taken from a Gideon Hotel in Juarez. A Gideon Hotel? I asked. Yes, they're only the largest company on the planet. They do more than just drugs. Medicine, hotels, mercenaries, mass murder, chemical weapons, zombies? Is Victor a resident evil fan? I asked. Horseman cocked his head to the side. What? Nothing. Where do we start? I cut into the hotel security feed. They were hit by a hit squad. It seems Chad was taken by Jamie. The rest of Ophelia's team was taken by Juarez police. The video screen in the armory came to life. On it showed Ophelia cuffed to a chair. She looked up to see a figure walk in. One that made my blood run cold. Carlos Estevez stood ahead of her. My mind flashed back to that day in his mansion. To me, finding her with pieces of her dress cut off and him in a puddle of his own blood. This was taken at Diablos. How's he? I started. Same as you, I assume. Which brings up another issue. We need to figure out where he got it. I knew Diablos existed. It was a poorly held secret among the intelligence community in Mexico. The private prison of Carlos Estevez himself. It should have been destroyed when Ophelia killed him. It was also an all-male prison, which made the hairs on my arm stand up. I was suddenly terrified for Ophelia. So, she's being held in Diablos. That bastard. I growled under my breath. I'm willing to send you in, but there will be some rules. No contact with the team. Got it? They can't know. How am I supposed to rescue them if I can't make contact? I asked. The criminals that Estevez keeps there are all malevolently violent. Get in, shut down the power, get the cells open. Ophelia and her team are very capable. They can escape during the chaos. Getting them out isn't your only assignment for when you're there. Let me guess, you want intel on Estevez? I asked. The warden was one of his cartel's top guys. I need a cell phone. Sounds easy enough. When do I go in? Ten hours from now. I wish I could say I spent the next ten hours resting, but my anxiety had gotten the better of me. All I could think about was her. What has she gotten herself into? And for what? Revenge? Because I couldn't come back to her? I could feel the frustration withering me away. The ten hours turned to five, then to two, then to one. Each minute was agonizing. Eventually, the time came. Diablos held a legendary status amongst South American cartels. Rumors of it began during the early days of the Estevez dynasty, when the man had begun using his own cartel money to rebuild Juarez. He turned coal into diamond. His cartel removed thieves and rapists from the streets, low-level criminals. No one knew where they went at first, just that petty crime took a nosedive. Estevez looked like a hero. He was celebrated all over the country. Some of the other cartels started getting a little jealous, sending people into Juarez to try and soil the image. They vanished almost instantly. It was a Sicario that first built the metaphorical beans. He'd done some jobs for Estevez and wound up working as an informant for the CIA. He mentioned the prison in one of his debriefs. He'd taken at least a dozen people there and left them. No judge, no jury, no trial. If you were even suspected of a petty crime, you went to Diablos. A lot of people wondered, of course, how Carlos had gotten hold of the facility. Some of the rumors involving a certain 
pharmaceutical company, of course. And there was talk about experiments being conducted on the prisoners underneath the prison. But no one ever made it out, so no one knew for sure. The horseman reminded me maybe three more times that I wasn't to make contact with him before he teleported me inside the prison. When I arrived, I found myself standing in a supply closet. A darkened supply closet. I'm in their security feet. Warden's office is just down the hall and on the right. A horseman's voice said through my comlink. I carefully opened the closet doorway and peered outside. Everything was calm. The hallway was brightly illuminated by the lights on the ceiling. I cloaked my suit and stepped out. I started making my way towards the warden's office. It didn't take long for me to get there. When I did, I found it empty. Just a small wooden desk, a file cabinet, and four walls. It was smaller than I'd expected. The desk was empty, not even a cell phone or a laptop on it. I very quickly turned and started rummaging through the filing cabinet. It didn't take me very long, but I found the prison blueprints, as well as the files on the lower levels of the prison. In particular, something called Project 43, or, as Carlos had dubbed it, the Ghost Legion. You see, when Ophelia killed the good Carlos, the cartel split into factions, a rival cartels moved into Juarez, a war broke out over the months that followed. A war that suddenly ended over the course of one night. Most of the faction leaders either dying or disappearing. All in thanks to the re-emerging Daddy Estevez and his ghost legion. That isn't good. Horseman said into my comlink link in an ominous tone. I'm guessing the warden's phone can wait, I said, examining the files myself. Get to the security room. Once the ride starts, get to the sub-level. My next task was to head towards the security control room. There, I could shut down the power and open all the cells. I also needed to track down the warden, but that didn't matter as much to me as it did to horsemen. Cloaking and getting to the security room wasn't hard. I only passed a few guards along the way. Perks of being invisible, I guess. The only downside was that there was no way I was going to be able to open the door without the guard inside noticing it. I had to think about this for a second. I knocked on the security door. I watched as the groggy security guard got up through the window on the door. The security room was small. It was almost the size of a large closet with a desk and a wall full of security monitors. The guard staggered over and looked out the window. I was still cloaked. He looked around and then rolled his eyes before walking back to his chair. I knocked again. He turned back to the door, his face full of aggravation and annoyance. I knocked again. He begrudgingly shot to his feet and yanked open the doorway. I trap kicked him back into the room. He loudly crashed into the security monitors. I walked into the room and shut the door behind me. The man was out cold. I got onto their computer and started typing away. It took only a few seconds to find the cell they were keeping her. I clicked on it. The screen popped open with a live feed. She was sitting on her bed. There were two men in the cell with her. Both were CIA agents whose files I'd read. A tall, red-headed man called Ray Bussy and a short Filipino man who went by Miguel. If my files were correct, Miguel was a prodigal genius. He had built drones for DARPA before he joined the CIA. Ray was a former soldier. He was young too, one of the youngest men to ever join the agency. He had a black eye as well, almost like he'd taken a fist to the face. I didn't, however, see chat which meant Jamie hadn't stuffed him here. That was a problem for another time. I watched Ophelia for a minute. She looked so sad. I wanted to tell her I was alive. I wanted to bad. God, I missed her. I typed a little more. Suddenly, the prison system sprang to life. A countdown began. I'd essentially set all the systems to open the cells and then shut down. What I didn't realize was that there was a guard staring into the room behind me. I heard shouting coming from behind me. I turned just as the door flew open. The fight was on. The first guard opened fire in my direction. Alarms suddenly went off. I moved quickly, 
shoving my sword into his chest before moving to the next guard. Then the next, then the next. I slashed and cut my way into the hallway. More guards were waiting for me, their bullets bouncing off of my suit. I cut them down too. By then, the alarms were blaring and the cell doors had opened. They've gotten out of their cell and are looking for a way out. Get to the sub-level. Horseman sit into my comm link. I did as told, running down a hallway into a dark winding staircase. The sub-level was filled with various labs that I knew from Project 43's files. The place was like a maze. Luckily, I knew exactly where I was going. It was a lap at the end of the maze, one where a man had been locked in what looked like a glass box. Only, the glass box had almost demonic-looking symbols painted in blood all over them. The body was that of a man, one clad in Roman-style armor. He knelt with his sword in the ground, sniffing the air as I came closer. His black eyes shot up and glared at me. That was when I realized his face seemed almost reptilian, being made from white scales. His nose was comprised of two slits, almost like that of a snake. He smiled at me, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. Trent Grayson, it growled. You know me? I asked. I know of you. The demons in hell. They long for your flesh. They should get in line. What are you? You read the file. I am Legion. I readied my sword. I knew I was going to have to kill this thing. My hut was going nuts with the demonic energy detection, even more so than that of the possessed woman from the island. Legion stepped closer to the glass. He's trying to stall. A horseman said into my comm link. You helped Istavis eliminate his competition. Why does he have you locked away? Whoever said we were locked away? We? I asked. Legion only smiled and looked behind me. I turned and saw two other woman soldiers emerging from the darkness behind me. They didn't look like him though. They both looked like normal people almost. Only very scarred with black eyes and green skin. Behold, the survivors of the ninth, their souls and bodies given to the master of my realm. I readied myself for a fight. The two men at their shields raced. Their swords ignited, but they weren't exactly blue. They were almost purple, almost like they had been corrupted. They both charged at me, faster than I expected. I was barely able to parry their sword strikes and found myself on the defensive. This didn't last long as I pulled my pistol from my hip while trying to block and dodge their swords. What are these things? I asked as I managed to squeeze off a round into one of their eyeballs. He screamed in pain as he backed off a few steps, leaving me one on one with the other. It charged at me and tried to slash. He was fast. I was slightly faster evading the strike and delivering a thrust of my own. One found its way into the soldier's throat. Survivors of the Ninth Roman Legion, ones who must have surrendered at the River Styx. The Legion must have had Istavius using blood magic to summon them here. From where? I asked. From hell. The now one-eyed soldier glared at me for a moment. I watched in horror as his eye suddenly started to heal on its own. You have to use your sword, Horseman said. I see that, I replied. I could hear Legion cackle from his cage. The remaining soldier charged me, throwing a few strikes with his sword. Our blades met a few times, sending sparks flying across the room. This one was far more skilled than his counterpart. He seemed to be able to match my sword strikes. I still had my pistol though. He was being a bit more cautious now, keeping his shield over his eyes when I raised it. That was his mistake to make. I raised my pistol at his face and fired. He blocked the bullets with his shield. So, I went low, sliding past him and slashing his leg off. The Roman fell to the ground, and before he could comprehend what had happened, I cut his head off. Welcome to the future, I said as I turned back to Legion. 
the demon in the box smiled at me. Oh my boy, you come exactly as advertised. He purred. I read it my sword. I wanted to cut this fucker to pieces now. I stepped towards the cage, only for Legion to suddenly vanish. I stopped dead in my tracks. What was that? I asked. He went back to hell. It looks like the box that he was in was a summoning box. It's a long story, but he wouldn't be able to exist in our world without it. I looked down at the two dead Roman soldiers. They were like me, weren't they? At one point in time, the ninth is a different story for another day. Most are revenants now. The survivors were all tortured until they became loyal slaves of Abaddon and his generals, Legion being one of them. Estevis must have made some friends before Victor brought him back. I thought demons couldn't exist in our world. I get how Legion did it, but what about the soldiers? They were born on Earth. They could be summoned with a blood sacrifice. Do you think there are more? I asked. No, not if Legion left. With that, I started making my way back upstairs. Horseman had found the warden. He was heading into a storage area for most of the prisoners' personal belongings. The only problem? Ophelia and her team were in the same storage area. I ran hard, cloaking my suit as I did so. I also hit the EMP button on my suit. All the lights around me shut off, bathing the hallway in blackness. My hut switched to night vision. I walked into the storage room to find the warden and several guards with weapons aimed at Ophelia and her team. But everyone seemed confused at the sudden power outage. I didn't waste any time. I ignited my sword behind the warden, and then went to my bloody work. Some guards got shots off, but it didn't matter. When the lights came back on, I was standing there with my sword in one hand and the warden cowering at my feet. I'd hit him a few times and stolen his phone in the darkness. I looked up at Ophelia and her team. They all stood there dumbstruck. Is that a fucking Power Ranger? Asked Miguel. Who are you? Ophelia asked. It was just like her to be suspicious of someone who just saved her. She was every bit as beautiful as I remembered. You guys need to move. Shaw will be here any second. I've got work to do. I turned to walk out, my eyes catching a man I had not recognized with Ophelia's group. A scraggly looking man who honestly almost looked like Estevez. The man was staring daggers into the warden. He gripped the fire axe tightly. I walked out of the room. I could hear as the warden begged the man for his life. I could hear Ophelia's footsteps following me. I'd recognized the toot anywhere. My heart rate escalated a bit. Then I was suddenly teleported. I stood on the rooftop of the prison. A few minutes had passed, and I had watched Ophelia, her teams, and the unnamed prisoner get into an osprey where Shaw had been waiting. I exhaled a sigh of relief. I heard the footsteps behind me. I give you orders not to make contact, Horseman said. They were cornered. Relax. They don't know who I am. They can't know. Shaw needs plausible deniability. You're a weapon. I took a deep breath as I pulled my helmet off and turned to him. I could see the frustration on his face. I still don't like it, I said. He considered this for a second before speaking. It doesn't matter what you like. All that matters is that we stop Gideon. And trust me, kid, you'll understand. I chuckled. It's been a while since anyone called me kid. The horseman snapped his fingers as police sirens could be heard in the distance. We found ourselves on a beach. My eyes drifted to the full moon overhead. I've got the coordinates for a place called Deadfall. You're right about Carlos Estevez. He's been going there once a week since he's come back, which means their Omega Serum isn't complete. The horseman took another deep breath. Unfortunately, I fear it's not the Omega Serum that needs to be destroyed. I finally finished sorting through the files you got from Gideon Tower. And? I asked. The girl is the key, but we knew that already. They need her blood. If we were smart about this, 
we'd kill her and burn the body. I thought about this for a second, my mind having flashbacks to Chad shooting the girl in Amsterdam. Grace didn't deserve any of this. I had been partially responsible for Chad's mistake. I had covered up for Chad. I remembered what Horseman said earlier. I was a weapon. But even so, that's not a line I'm willing to cross, I said. The horseman smirked. Good. It got quiet on the beach for a moment. I watched the moonlit waves dance on the beach. I'm sending you to that fall. Once you're there, I want you to sink it to the bottom of the ocean. I took a deep breath as I put my mask back on. Yes, sir. <laughs>